Come As You Are, The Story of Nirvana by Michael Azarad, first printed in October 93 in the United States of Americana. Chapter 1. A greasy-haired little rebellious kid. Aberdeen, Washington. Population 16,660. Is 108 long miles southwest of Seattle, way out on the remote Washington coast. Seattle has a lot of rain, but Aberdeen has more. Up to seven feet a year, casting a constant dreary pall over the town. Far from the nearest freeway, nothing comes in and rarely does anything come out. Art and culture are best left to the snooty types over in Seattle. Among the fascinating activities listed in a brochure from the Grays Harbor County Chamber of Commerce are bowling, chainsaw competitions, and video arcades. Route 12 into Aberdeen is bordered by an endless succession of trailer parks. Beyond them are hundreds of thousands of acres of timberland, often marred by vast stubbly scars where the loggers have been clear-cutting. Coming in from the east, the first thing a visitor sees of Aberdeen is the sprawling, ugly Weyerhaeuser lumberyard fronting the Wishkaw River, where the limbless carcasses of once proud trees lie stacked like massacre victims. Surveying the scene from the other side of the river is a long strip of plastic fast food joints. Logging dominates the town, or rather, it once did. Business has been falling off for years, and layoffs are turning Aberdeen into a ghost town. These days, the streets downtown are slowly filling with empty or boarded-up storefronts. The only places that are doing good business are taverns, like the Silver Dollar and the aptly named Poor House, as well as the local pawn shop, which overflows with guns, chainsaws, and electric guitars. The suicide rate of Grays Harbor County is one of the highest in the nation. Alcoholism is rampant, and crack came to town years ago. Crack was introduced in the 80s mainly into urban neighborhoods, basically as a mean for the government to lock up young black males. But that's another story. People hate the spotted owl. Recipes for cooking the endangered creature pop up on local bumper stickers. Even though decentralization of the timber industry, rising labor costs, and automation are really what's putting people out of work. One of the biggest mills in town used to employ scores of workers, and now it has five. Four men and a laser-guided, computerized cutting machine. This is something I think I mentioned in a Nirvana, in a, in a history of Nirvana. Nirvana video, the spotted owl um, was an endangered species, an endangered species. A, a lot of activist groups were preventing logging companies from destroying entire forests because that's where the spotted owl lived. But the spotted owl is not what made the lumber industry fall apart. It was mainly laser guided machinery. Why hire 10 men to do a job that a machine can do by itself? Naturally, all these families in Aberdeen that were left high and dry, no longer had a job, can't feed your family, they had to have a scapegoat. They had to have something to blame. They blamed the spotted owl. That's why people are driving around with bumper stickers with recipes on how to cook it. Things didn't used to be so rough. Aberdeen was once a bustling seaport where sailors stopped off for rest, food, and some rented female companionship. Fact is, the town was once one big whorehouse centered on the notorious Hume Street, which the town fathers renamed State Street in the 50s to try to bury the memories. Later, the town became a railroad terminus and the home of dozens of sawmills and logging operations. So pre-1950s, it was one big whorehouse for sailors. After that, they got into the logging industry. Uh, by the late 80s, the logging industry has been transformed and reimagined by laser-guided machinery. Aberdeen teamed with single young men making plenty of money in the wood industry, and prostitution thrived. With as many as 50 bordellas or women's boarding houses, these women lived there and they also prostituted themselves right out of their own room that they rented. And there would be like a lady of the house who was basically the landlord. She owned the building. So with as many as 50 bordellas in the downtown area at one point, prostitution lasted as long as the late 50s when a police crackdown finally put an end to it. Some say Aberdeen's unsavory past gives its residents an inferiority complex. 
complex. This is where Kurt Donald Cobain was born on February 20th, 1967 to Wendy Cobain, a homemaker, and her husband, Donald, a mechanic at the Chevron station in town. The young family started out in a rental house in nearby Hoquiam, then moved to Aberdeen when Kurt was six months old. Kurt grew up not knowing where his family name came from. His maternal grandfather is German, but that's all he knew. Only recently did he discover that his father's side of the family is full-blooded Irish and that Cobain is a corruption of the name Coburn. So a lot of immigrants would change their names to sound more American? Although the Cobains were of humble means, life started out very well for their golden-haired son. My mom was always physically affectionate with me, says Kurt. We always kissed goodbye and hugged. It was really cool. I'm surprised to find out that so many families aren't that way. Those were pretty blissful times. So when Kurt was very young and his parents were still married, his mother gave him, gave him a lot of attention. Kurt's sister, Kim, Kim, which I would love to see an interview with Kim. I don't think I've ever seen an interview with Kim. I would like for her to come out of the out of her closet and talk more. Kurt's sister Kim was born three years after he was, but Kurt and his mother had already established a tight bond. There's nothing like your firstborn. Nothing, says Wendy, now remarried and still living in the same house in Aberdeen with her husband and eight-year-old daughter. No child even comes close to that. I was totaled out on him. My every waking hour was for him. Kurt was obviously a bright child. I remember calling my mother, Wendy recalls, and telling her it kind of scared me because he had perceptions like I've never seen a small child have. Kurt had started showing an interest in music when he was two, which was not surprising since his mother's side of the family was very musical. Wendy's brother Chuck played in a rock and roll band, her sister Mary played guitar, and everyone in the family had some sort of musical talent. At Christmas, they would all sing or act out skits. Wendy's uncle changed his name from Delbert Freidenberg to Dale Arden, moved to California to become an operatic balladeer, and cut a few records in the late 40s and early 50s. He became friends with actor Brian Keith, who later starred in the 60s sitcom Family Affair, and Jay Silverheels, who played Tonto in the Lone Ranger TV series. So as Wendy jokes, this celebrity thing is nothing new to the family. Aunt Mary gave Kurt Beatles and Monkeys records when he was seven or so. She would invite Kurt over to her house to watch her band practice. A country musician who had actually recorded a single, Mary had played in bar bands around Aberdeen for years, sometimes appeared solo at the Riviera Steakhouse, and once placed second on a local TV talent contest called You Can Be a Star. Mary tried to teach Kurt how to play guitar, but he didn't have the patience. In fact, it was hard to get him to sit for anything. He had been diagnosed as hyperactive. Like many kids of his generation, Kurt had been given the drug Ritalin, a form of speed, which counteracts hyperactivity. It kept him up until four in the morning. Sedatives made him fall asleep in school. Finally, they tried subtracting sugar and the infamous red dye number two from his diet, and it worked. It was hard for a hyperactive kid to stay away from sugar because, as Wendy puts it, they are, like, addicted to it. They are, like, addicted to it. Sounds like a pretty intelligent mother. As well, how about we not give our kids any fucking drugs and just accept the fact that they're kids, they have a high metabolism rate, and kids have lots of energy, unlike us adults. But not being able to have a candy bar hardly dampened Kurt's spirits. He got up every day with such joy that there was another day to be had, says Wendy. He was so enthusiastic. He would come running out of his bedroom so excited that there was another day ahead of him, and he couldn't wait to find out what it was going to bring him. So much for the family depression story. I was an extremely happy child, says Kurt. I was constantly screaming and singing. I didn't know when to quit. I'd eventually get beaten up by other kids because I'd get so excited about wanting to play with them. I took play very seriously. I was just really happy. The first kid of his generation, Kurd, had seven aunts and uncles on his mother's side alone who would argue over who got to babysit him. Used to being the center of attention, he entertained anybody who wanted to watch. He was so dramatic, says Wendy. He'd throw himself down on the floor at the store for this old man because this old man would just love to have Kurt sing for him. One of Kurt's favorite records was Alice's Restaurant by Arlo Guthrie. Often he'd sing Guthrie's motorcycle song. 
I don't want a pickle. I just want to ride on my motorcycle. And I don't want to die. Possibly the first person Kurt ever performed for was that old man at the grocery store. His Aunt Mary gave him a bass drum when he was seven. Kurt would strap it on and walk around the neighborhood wearing a hunting hat and his dad's tennis shoes, beating the drum and singing Beatles songs like Hey Jude and Revolution. Kurt didn't like it when men looked at Wendy, a very attractive woman with blonde hair and pretty blue eyes. Don never seemed to care, but Kurt always got angry and jealous. Mommy, that man's looking at you, he'd say. Once, he even told off a policeman. Even at age three, Kurt didn't much like policemen. When he'd spot one, he'd sing a little song. Corn on the cops, corn on the cops. The cops are coming, they're going to kill you. Every time I saw a cop, I'd start singing that at them and pointing at them and telling them that they were evil, says Kurt, grinning. I had this massive thing about cops. I didn't like them at all. When he was a couple of years older, Kurt would fill 7-Up cans full of pebbles and heave them at police cars, although he never actually hit one. That was also about the time that Kurt somehow learned how to extend his middle finger in the time-honored manner. While his mother drove around town doing errands, he'd sit in the back seat of the car and flip the bird to everyone they passed by. By the time Kurt was in second grade, everybody had noticed how well he could draw. After a while, says Wendy, it kind of got crammed down his throat. Every present was a paintbrush or an easel. We kind of almost killed it for him. Everybody thought Kurt's drawings and paintings were great, except for him. He would never be happy about his art, says Wendy. He would never be satisfied with it, like typical artists are. One day around Halloween, Kurt came home with a copy of the school newspaper. It had a drawing Kurt had done on the cover, an honor usually reserved for kids who were at least fifth graders. Kurt was really mad about it when he came home, because he didn't think his picture was that great. His attitude toward adults changed because of that, says Wendy. Everybody was telling him how much they loved his art, but he was never satisfied with it. Up until third grade, Kurt wanted to be a rock star. He'd play Beatles records and mime along with his little plastic guitar. Then for a long time, he wanted to be a stuntman. I like to play outside, catch snakes, jump my bicycle off the roof, he recalls. Evil Knievel was my only idol as a child. Once he took all the bedding and pillows out of the house, put it on the deck, and jumped onto it from the roof. Another time, he took a piece of metal, duct taped it to his chest, and put a bunch of firecrackers on it and lit them. Sometimes Kurt would visit Uncle Chuck, Wendy's brother, who played in a band. Chuck had built speakers for his basement studio that were so big he couldn't get them out of the room. He'd put Kurt downstairs, give him a microphone, and roll some tape. Wendy still has a tape he made when he was four or so. Kurt sings, and then... When he thinks no one is listening, he starts saying dirty words. Poodoo, poodoo, he says. I know another dirty word. Don and Wendy got Kurt a little Mickey Mouse drum set. I kind of pushed drums on him because I wanted to be a drummer, Wendy admits. But my mother thought that was so unfeminine, so she never let me play drums. Kurt didn't need to be pushed. As soon as he could sit up and hold things, he had been banging on pots and pans. He thrashed his Mickey Mouse drum set every day after school until it was broken. Although it wasn't in the best section of Aberdeen, in fact, the neighborhood is quite run down, the Cobain home was always the nicest on the block. Don kept it in tip-top shape, installing the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, the fake brick fireplace, the imitation wood paneling. It was white trash posing as middle class, Kurt says of his upbringing. Wendy came from a family that was hardly well-to-do, but her mother always made sure that her children looked like they had a lot more than what they did. Wendy was the same way. Every morning, she would diligently feather Kurt's hair for that Sean Cassidy look, make sure he brushed his teeth, and dressed him in the nicest clothes they could afford. And he would trudge off to school in his wafel stomper hiking boots. She even made Kurt wear a sweater that he was allergic to, because it looked good on him. Both my kids were probably the best dressed kids in Aberdeen, says Wendy. I made sure of that. Wendy tried to keep her kids away from what she calls certain friends from certain kinds of backgrounds that lived in certain situations. Kurt says she basically told him to stay away from the poor kids. My mom thought that I was better than those kids, so I picked on them every once in a while. 
the scummy kids, the dirty kids. I just remember there were a couple of kids that stunk like pee all the time and I would bully them around and get in fights with them. By fourth grade, I realized that these kids are probably cooler than the higher class children. More down to earth, down to the dirt. Later on, Kurt's unwashed hair, ever-present stubble, and tattered wardrobe would become world-famous trademarks. Kurt started taking drum lessons in third grade. Ever since I can remember, since I was a little kid, says Kurt, I wanted to be Ringo Starr. But I wanted to be John Lennon playing the drums. Kurt played in the school band in grade school, though he never learned how to read music. He'd just wait for the kid in the first chair to learn the song and then copy what he was doing. By the Christmas of 1974, when he was seven, Kurt got the idea that his mom thought he was a problem child. The only thing I really wanted that year was a $5 Starsky and Hutch gun, Kurt says. I got a lump of coal instead. Kurt says he was ambidextrous, but his father tried to force him to use his right hand, fearing Kurt would have problems later in life as a lefty. He became a lefty anyway. For most of his life, Kurt has been plagued by one health problem or another. Besides his hyperactivity, he's always suffered from chronic bronchitis. In eighth grade, Kurt was diagnosed with a minor case of scoliosis, or curvature of the spine. As time went by, the weight of his guitar actually made the curvature worse. If he had been right-handed, he says, it would have corrected the problem. In 1975, when Kurt was eight, his parents divorced. Wendy says she divorced Don because he simply wasn't around very much. He was always off playing basketball or baseball, coaching teams or refereeing. In retrospect, she wonders if she ever really loved him. Don bitterly opposed the divorce. Both Wendy and Don admit the kids were later used in a war between their parents. Kurt took the divorce and its aftermath very hard. It's just destroyed his life, says Wendy. He changed completely. I think he was ashamed, and he became very inward. He just held everything. He became really shy. I think he's still suffering, she adds. Instead of the sunny, outgoing kid Kurt once was, he became real sullen, Wendy says, kind of mad, noise browning and ridiculing. On the wall in his bedroom, Kurt wrote, I hate mom. I hate dad, dad hates mom, mom hates dad. It simply makes you want to be sad. A few feet over, he drew caricatures of Wendy and Don along with the words, dad sucks and mom sucks. Below, he drew a brain with a big question mark over it. The drawings are still there to this day, along with some nifty Led Zeppelin and Iron Maiden logos that he drew. He denies he made them, but sisters don't lie. Kurt was like a lot of kids of his generation. In fact, everyone who has ever been in Nirvana, but one, has come from a broken down home. The divorce rate skyrocketed in the mid-70s, more than doubling in 10 years. The children of these broken marriages didn't have a world war or depression to contend with. They just didn't have a family. Consequently, their battles were private. Kurt says it was like a light went out in him, a light he's been trying to recapture ever since. I just remember all of a sudden not being the same person, feeling like I wasn't worthy anymore. He says, I didn't feel like I deserved to be hanging out with the other kids because they had parents and I didn't anymore, I guess. I was just pissed off at my parents for not being able to deal with their problems, he continues. Throughout most of my childhood, after the divorce, I was kind of ashamed of my parents. But Kurt had begun to feel like an outsider even before the divorce. I didn't have anything in common with my dad especially, says Kurt. He wanted me to be in sports and I didn't like sports. I was artistic and he just didn't appreciate that type of thing. So I just always felt ashamed. I just couldn't understand how I was a product of my parents because they weren't artistic and I was. I liked music and they didn't. Subconsciously, maybe I thought I was adopted. Ever since that episode of the Partridge family, when Danny thought he was adopted, I really related to that. Kurt's creativity and intelligence and the early realization that he was an artist compounded the problem. Until I was about 10 or 11, I didn't realize that I was different from the other kids at school, he says. I started to realize that I was more interested in drawing and listening to music, more so than the other kids. It just slowly grew on me and I started to realize that. So by the time I was 12, 
I was fully withdrawn. Convinced he'd never find anyone like himself, he simply stopped trying to make friends. This town, if he would have been anywhere else, he would have been fine, says Wendy. But this town is just exactly like Peyton Place. Everybody is watching everyone and judging, and they have their little slots they like everyone to stay in, and he didn't. Kurt lived with his mother for a year after the divorce, but he didn't like her new boyfriend, whom he calls a mean, huge wife beater. At first, Wendy attributed Kurt's dislike of her boyfriend to mere jealousy. That's fucked up. Okay, I gotta interject my opinion. You don't f put anyone before your kids, man or woman, mother or father. If someone has a problem with your kid, you send them down the f road. You don't say, oh, you're jealous of my new boyfriend. You're jealous of my new girlfriend. F that. The real reason Wendy sent Kurt to live with Don at this point in time, and this is the main reason I really dislike Wendy O'Connor or Wendy Cobain or whatever her name is, Kurt witnessed this man, her boyfriend, break his mother's arm, wanted his mother to press charges. Wendy went to the hospital, gets her arm fixed, refuses to press charges. Kurt continues to press the police issue, so she sends Kurt to Don so her boyfriend doesn't get in trouble for breaking her arm. Five years later, she realized her boyfriend was a little nuts. Oh, so now he's nuts. A paranoid schizophrenic, in fact. Kurt was extremely unhappy and would take out his anger on everyone from Wendy to his babysitters, whom he would usually lock out of the house. Wendy couldn't control him anymore, so she sent him to live with Don at his trailer home in Montesano, an even smaller logging community about 20 miles east of Aberdeen. Don's place wasn't a mobile home, but a prefabricated house that is towed in sections behind a truck to a trailer park and assembled. It wasn't one of the more luxurious ones, the double wide ones that the rich white trash got to live in, Kurt says. At first it was great. Don bought Kurt a mini bike and they did things together like go to the beach for the weekend or go camping. He had everything, says Don. He had it made. He had the run of the whole house. He had a motorcycle. He got to do whatever he wanted to do. We were always doing stuff. But then, when two other kids and a new mother comes in, Don once offhandedly told Kurt that he'd never get married again. He soon remarried in February of 1978. His new wife brought along her two kids, and they all moved into a proper house in Montesano. Kurt didn't get along with his new family at all, especially his new stepmom. Still to this day, I can't think of a faker person, he says. She's one of the most nicest people, Don protests. Treated him perfect. Tried stuff. She got him jobs and tried to cope with everything. But it was just screwing up the whole family. Just the way he was acting and things that he was doing and not doing. I watched an interview with Don once. His wife interjects. Kurt's st stepmom interjects and says he was doing things to her kids. Now, she never says what he was doing, of course. There was never no report of it or complaint. No one else ever heard of such a thing. Doing things to her kids. Okay, what the f*** ever, lady. Maybe you were just trying to push him out of the way because you wanted Don to, to look at your kids as his kids and take care of them first. Maybe that was the problem. It's also worth mentioning that they moved into a three-bedroom home. Instead of giving Kurt, the oldest, his own bedroom, they give the two young, very young kids each their own room and then put Kurt in the basement. And we're not talking about a nice, clean basement. We're talking about a damp, moldy, dark basement. Wouldn't it make more sense for the two young siblings to share a room and then Kurt has his own room? Kurt skipped school and refused to do household chores. What teenager doesn't? Don says he didn't even show up for the table bussing job he arranged for him. Oh, I thought she arranged for the jobs. Now Don's saying he arranged for the job. He began picking on his younger stepbrother and didn't like his stepsister much either. Even though she was four years younger than Kurt, she was assigned to babysit for him when their parents went out. Pretty belittling to assign the younger kid to babysit the older kid. Also, what older sibling doesn't pick on their younger sibling? I'm having trouble troubles with that right now with my daughter picking on her younger brother. Then he noticed that his dad started to buy lots of toys for his stepsister and brother. While he skulked around in his basement room, they would go out to the mall and come back with a star horse or a Tonka truck. And yeah, they put Kurt in the basement by himself. 
I tried to do everything to make him feel wanted, to be part of the family and everything, says Don, who maintains he got legal custody of Kurt just to make him feel more a part of the family. But he just didn't want to be there and wanted to be with his mom and she didn't want him. And then here she is, the goody-goody, and I'm the big bad guy. Now I will say this, Don took custody of Kurt when Wendy gave him away. Make no f***ing mistake about it, Wendy gave him away. Wendy went off and had another family with his wife beater, and Don had another family with Kurt's stepmom. Neither one of them wanted him anymore. He was from their marriage. I don't think either one of them really cared to rehash their marriage, and looking at Kurt reminded them of the other parent. One more thing, Kurt went how many years? Basically the rest of his life without talking to his dad once he started Nirvana. I don't think that anyone would be that resentful toward their own father unless there was some really horrible neglect going on. People forgive their parents for all kinds of transgressions. So the fact that Kurt never forgave his dad, never spoke to his father after Nirvana was created, except for the one time his dad showed up backstage at a concert and, and Kurt never wrote him or talked to him again, and that was Don seeking out Kurt, not Kurt seeking out Don. I think he had to have been a pretty terrible father for a boy to turn his back on his father. But there may be more to it than that. I'm emotional at times, but other times I'm not, and I just don't know how to express myself, Don admits. Sometimes my smart-ass stuff hurts people's feelings. I'm not trying to hurt somebody's feelings, but I don't know I'm doing it, I guess. Maybe something like that happened with Kurt. Maybe, says Don. Definitely, says Don. Oddly, Don seems to have genuine amnesia about his years with Kurt. Although he comes across as a sweet and simple man these days, the strain of the divorce may have brought out a darker side. Did I rule with a strong arm, he says? Okay, my wife says I do. I do probably blow up before I think, and I hurt people's feelings, and I get over it. I forget about it, and nobody else does. Yeah, my dad, he beat me with a belt and stuff, gave me black eyes and stuff, but I don't know. I spanked him with the bell, I guess. Yes. So we can kind of see where that whole thing went. Everything that Kurt did was a reflection on Don, says Wendy. If he was bad at a baseball game, he would be just infuriated after that game to the point where he'd just humiliate Kurt. He would never allow Kurt to be a little kid. He wanted him to be a little adult and be perfectly behaved, never do anything wrong. He would knuckle wrap Kurt and call him a dummy. He'd just get irritated really quickly and whack over the head. My mom says she remembers a time when he actually threw Kurt clear across the room when he was like six years old. Don says he doesn't remember any of this. So, Wendy, you know that he beats Kurt, but you give Kurt away to him. She, it's funny how she tries to play the good guy, but she's the one who gave the kid to Don knowing he was physically abusive and emotionally neglectful. If you knew that a person was abusive towards children, would you give your child to them? It's called denial. Wendy replies, it sounds like Wendy might be in a little bit of denial herself. After the divorce, Don had begun working at Meyer Brothers, a logging company, as a tallyman. Basically, says Kurt, he just walked around all day and counted logs. His idea of a father and son day out would be to take me out to work on Saturdays and Sundays, Kurt continues. I would sit in his office while he went and counted logs. It's really a quite exciting weekend. In his dad's office, Kurt would draw pictures and make prank phone calls. Sometimes he'd go out into the warehouse and play on top of the stacks of 2 by 4s after all that excitement, he would get into his dad's van and listen to Queen's News of the World over and over again on the 8-track. Sometimes he'd listen so long that he'd drain the battery and they'd have to find someone to jumpstart the engine. Don used to run around with the jock crowd in high school, but he never excelled in sports, perhaps because he was small for his age. Don's father expected a lot from him, too, but he just couldn't compete. Some believe that's why Don pushed Kurt into sports. Don got Kurt to join the junior high wrestling team. Kurt hated the grueling practices and worse yet, having to hang out with the jocks. I hated it. Every second of it, says Kurt. I just f hated it. 
He'd come home in the evening from practice, quote, and there'd be this disgusting, shriveled up, dry meal that my stepmom had cooked with a lot of love and preparation, and it had been sitting there since dinner time and the oven on low heat, and everything was totally dried up and awful. She was the worst cook, unquote. Nevertheless, Kurt says he did pretty well at wrestling, basically because he could vent his anger on the mat. But on the day of a big championship match, Kurt decided to get back at his dad. He and his opponent walked onto the mat and got into position while Don sat in the bleachers, rooting for his son. Quote, I was down on my hands and knees, and I looked up at my dad and smiled, and I waited for the whistle to blow, says Kurt, just staring straight into his face, and then I just instantly clammed up. I put my arms together and let the guy pin me. You should have seen the look on his face. He actually walked out halfway through the match because I did it like four times in a row. Don doesn't remember that episode either, but Kurt says the incident resulted in one of the times he had to move out of the house and live with his aunt and uncle. In other words, Don got so mad about Kurt allowing this guy to pin him and humiliating him in front of all the other big tough dads that he kicked his f***ing son. He kicked his own son out of the house. Don also took Kurt hunting once. But once they got into the woods, Kurt refused to go with the hunting party. He spent the whole day from dawn to dusk in the truck. Now that I look back on it, Kurt says, I know I had the sense that killing animals is wrong, especially for sport. I didn't understand that at the time. I just knew that I didn't want to be there. Something very similar happened to me the first time my stepfather took me hunting. I would not shoot the gun and he took it in one hand and fired it off in the air like a madman and yelled at me and basically left me in the woods to find my own way home. It wasn't that I was afraid of the gun. I'd shot the gun plenty of times. I just didn't see any point in killing the animal now if you're gonna kill a deer or something and eat it sure but just to kill an animal for sport is is stupid meanwhile kurt began to discover other kinds of rock music besides just the beatles and the monkeys don had begun to develop a pretty serious record collection after someone talked him into joining the columbia house record and tape club every month records by bands like aerosmith led zeppelin black sabbath and kiss would come in the mail. Don never got around to opening them, but after a few months, Kurt did. Kurt had begun hanging out with a bunch of guys who sported puka shells and feathered hair and kiss t-shirts. They were way older than me. They must have been in junior high, says Kurt. They were smoking pot and I just thought they were way cooler than my geeky fourth grade friends who watched Happy Days. I just let them come over to my house and eat my food just to have friends. These stoner guys soon noticed Don's awesome record collection and urged Kurt to play the records. After they turned me on to that music, says Kurt, I started turning into a little stoner kid. He never came out and said anything, even in his early years, about what was really bothering him or what he wanted, says Don. He's like me. Don't say anything and maybe it'll disappear or something. And don't explain. You just bottle it all up and it all comes out at one time. He got married and after that I was one of the last things of importance on his list, Kurt says. He just gave up because he was convinced that my mom had brainwashed me. That's a real pathetic, weak thing to base your son's existence on. I don't really think of my dad as a macho jerk, Kurt says. He isn't half as extreme as a lot of other fathers I've seen. So exactly what is Kurt's beef with his father? I don't even know, he confesses. I wish I could remember more. I never felt like I really had a father. I've never had a father figure who I could share things with. Ultimately, Don couldn't deal with his son either. So Kurt was shuffled through the family, eventually living with three different sets of aunts and uncles, as well as his grandparents on his father's side. He moved at least two times a year, between Montesano and Aberdeen, switching high schools as well. Wendy knew she should take Kurt back, but she had been going through her own traumas. She had finally gotten rid of the paranoid schizophrenic who had mentally and physically abused her, even putting her in the emergency room at one point. She had since lost her job and asked her brother Chuck, the musician, to take care of Kurt. For Kurt's 14th birthday, Chuck told Kurt he could either have a bicycle or a guitar. Kurt took the guitar, a secondhand electric that barely played and a beat up little 10 watt amp. I don't think it was even a harmony. Kurt says of the guitar. I think it was a Sears. He dropped the drums and took guitar lessons for a week or so, just long enough to learn how to play ACDC's Back in Black. That's pretty much the Louie Louie chord, says Kurt, and that's all you need to know. After that, he started writing his own songs. His guitar teacher, Warren Mason, 
who played in a band with Chuck, remembers Kurt as a quiet little nice kid. Kurt vehemently denies it, but Mason says he really wanted to learn how to play Stairway to Heaven. Kurt found Aberdeen intimidating. Compared to Montesano, Aberdeen was like the big city. I just thought these kids were a higher class of people and I wasn't quite worthy of being in their group, he says. In class, he'd read S.E. Hinton books like Rumblefish and The Outsiders and avoided speaking to anybody. He says he didn't make a single friend that year. Instead, he'd come home every day and play guitar until it was time for bed. He already knew how to play Back in Black, and he figured out a few more covers. The Cars, My Best Friend's Girl, Louie Louie, and Queen's Another One Bites the Dust. Early in 1980, when Kurt was 12, he and his friend Brendan had seen the B-52s on Saturday Night Live. They got bitten by the new wave bug, and Brendan got his parents to buy him some checkered vans. Kurt's dad couldn't afford that, so Kurt just drew a checkered board pattern on his regular sneakers. Um, if you know, if you look at old pictures of Kurt as a kid, with that first guitar, he also put a checkered board pattern on the guitar. Somewhere around the summer before 10th grade, Kurt began following the exploits of the Sex Pistols and Cream magazine. The idea of punk rock fascinated him. Unfortunately, the record store in Aberdeen didn't stock any punk rock records, so he didn't know what it sounded like. Alone in his room, he played what he thought it sounded like. So that's interesting. He played what he thought punk rock would sound like. Three chords and a lot of screaming, says Kurt. Not so far off the mark, as it turned out. <laughs> Maybe that's where that Nirvana sound comes from. A few years later, he finally tracked down a punk record, The Clash's sprawling, eclectic three-album set, Sandinista, and was disappointed when it didn't sound like what he thought punk should sound like. Kurt describes his early music as really raunchy riff rock. It was like Led Zeppelin, but it was raunchy, and I was trying to make it as aggressive and mean as I could, he says. I was thinking, what would punk rock really be like? What is it? How nasty is it? And I would try to play as nasty as I could. Turn my little 10 watt amplifier up as loud as it could go. I just didn't have any idea what I was doing. It was definitely a good release, says Kurt. I thought of it as a job. It was my mission. I knew I had to practice. As soon as I got my guitar, I just became so obsessed with it. Chris Novoselic gives an interview long after Kurt's death, and he says that even after Kurt's death, whenever he would pass a pawn shop, he, he said, I would catch myself looking in the window looking for a left-handed guitar because every time Kurt got a new guitar, a new left-handed guitar, he would become obsessed with the guitar and then there would be like 10 new songs. So Chris had become so used to trying to find a new guitar for Kurt, so Kurt would get obsessed with it and write new songs that he, caught, he would catch himself doing it even after Kurt's death. And, and that's pretty sad, but I thought it was an anecdote I should share. I had this feeling all the time. I always knew I was doing something that was special, says Kurt. I knew it was better, even though I couldn't prove it at the time. I knew I had something to offer, and I knew eventually I would have the opportunity to show people that I could write good songs, that I could contribute something musically to rock and roll. Kurt was desperate to take the next logical step and form a band. I wanted to see what it was like to write a song and see what it sounded like with all the instruments at once, Kurt says. I just wanted that, at least to practice. That's all I wanted. It would be four years before he would find a band, but it wasn't for lack of trying. In school, he met two kids named Scott and Andy who played bass and guitar and jammed out in an abandoned meat locker way out in the woods. Kurt went out there and played one day, and the three decided to form a band. Kurt agreed to leave his guitar out there because, after all, he was going to come back the very next day and rehearse again. But Scott and Andy kept putting off practice, and days turned into weeks, weeks into months. Kurt couldn't get his instrument back because he didn't have a car and his mom wouldn't drive him. He made do with a right-handed guitar owned by a kid whose mother had died and was staying at the Cobain's house. He was just this stoner guy who was really stump dumb, says Kurt. I liked him because he was a real depressed person. <laughs> Eventually, Kurt got a friend to drive him out to the woods where his guitar was and they found it in pieces. Just a neck and some electronic guts. Kurt painstakingly made a new body and wood shop, only to find that he didn't know the correct proportions to make it stay in tune. When I was a lot younger, around seven years old, I thought for sure I could be a rock star, says Kurt. There was no problem because I was so hyperactive and the world was in my hands. I could do anything. 
I knew I could be the president if I wanted to, but that was a stupid idea. I'd rather be a rock star. I didn't have any doubt. I was really into the Beatles and I didn't understand my environment. What was lying ahead? What kind of alienation I would feel as a teenager? I thought of Aberdeen as any other city in America, Kurt continues. I thought they were all the same. Everyone just got along and there wasn't nearly as much violence as there actually was and it would be really easy. I thought the United States was about as big as my backyard, so it'd be no problem to drive all over the place and play in a rock band and be on the cover of magazines and stuff. But then when I started becoming this manic depressive at 9 years old, I didn't look at it that way. It seemed so unrealistic. By 10th grade, Kurt had abandoned all fantasies of fame. I was so self-conscious at that time, he says. I had such a small amount of esteem that I couldn't even think of actually becoming a rock star, never mind dealing with what they would expect a rock star to be. I couldn't imagine being on television or doing interviews or anything like that. Stuff like that didn't even seep into my mind at the time. Kurt's father had made him join the Babe Ruth League baseball team. Basically, Kurt just warmed the bench, and whenever he was called to bat, he'd strike out on purpose, just so he wouldn't have to get into the game. On the bench, he hung out with a guy named Matt Lucan, and they talked about Kiss and Cheap Trick. The two had met before an electronics class at Montesano High. Lucan, who played in the Melvins and Mud Honey, Lucan remembers Kurt as, quote, this greasy-haired little rebellious kid. It's worth saying that Lucan also says Kurt was actually really good at baseball. He just chose to strike out. He chose to not participate. Lucan said when he wanted to play, he was actually really f***ing good at baseball. In my own opinion, I think Kurt wanted his dad to accept him for what he liked. For drawing and painting and writing music, you know? I think that was his way of rebelling. He's like, yeah, I'm good at sports. I can play sports, but I don't want you to like me for something you want me to do. I want you to like me for the things that I like to do. I'd be curious to hear what you guys think. I think Kurt was choosing to strike out and stuff to piss his dad off, who was ignoring him. Lucan played bass in a local band called the Melvins, whom Kurt had actually seen rehearse one night the summer before ninth grade. Kurt's friend Brendan knew someone who knew the drummer for the Melvins, and they wangled an invitation to the Melvins' practice, which was then an attic in someone's house. The Melvins had not gone punk yet, and were playing Hendrix and The Who covers. It was the first time Kurt had seen a real rock band up close and he was terrifically excited. I'd been drinking wine all night and I was really drunk and obnoxious and I remember complimenting them about a million times, says Kurt. I was so excited to see people my age in a band. It was so great. I was thinking, wow, these guys are so lucky. Disgusted with this fawning little squirt, they kicked Kurt out. Still drunk, he fell down the attic ladder as he left. In art class at Montesano High that year, Kurt again met Melvin's leader, Buzz Osborne, a stocky, wild-looking kid a couple of years his senior. At the time, Osborne was a big Who fan, but soon moved into punk rock. He had a photo book on the Sex Pistols, which he let Kurt borrow. Kurt was riveted. It was the first time he had gotten to see punk rock other than those precious few spreads in Cream. This was the Sex Pistols in all their wildness, says Kurt, and I got to read about them and everything. It was really cool. Soon he was drawing the Sex Pistols logo on his desk in every class and all over his peachy folder. Then he began telling anyone who would listen that he was going to start a punk rock band and that it was going to be really popular, still not having any idea what punk rock even sounded like. He struck me as a freak, says Kurt of Osborne, someone who I definitely wanted to get to know. Kurt envied Osborne because he had a punk rock band that actually played sometimes in Seattle and Olympia. And that's all I ever really wanted to do at that point, says Kurt. I didn't have any high expectations for my music at all. I just wanted to have the chance to play in front of some people in Seattle. The thought of being in a band that was successful enough to actually go on tour was too much to ask for at that time. The Melvins also included original drummer Mike Dillard, who was later replaced by Dale Crover. In their first punk phase, they played faster than light, hardcore. Then, when everyone began doing the same, they played as slow as they possibly could just to piss everybody off. And to really piss them off, they injected heavy metal into the mix. With 1987's seminal Gluey Porch Treatments album, the Melvins would become one of the founding fathers of what eventually became known as grunge. 
a new mutant form of punk rock that absorbed heavy metal as well as proletarian 70s hard rock bands such as Kiss and Aerosmith. Their sound revolutionized the Seattle music scene, which had previously been dominated by art rock bands. The Melvins had already played in Seattle when Kurt first saw them, and by 1985 had appeared on the Protean Deep Six collection along with the U-Men, Soundgarden, Green River, Malfunction, and Skinyard. Skinyard was Jack and Dino's band. Of course, you guys know Soundgarden, Green River. Some of the guys in Green River eventually become, I think, Mother Lovebone, and then Mother Lovebone becomes Pearl Jam. Except for the art rock U-Men, all mix varying amounts of punk, 70s style hard rock, and proletarian heavy metal into a crude but effective musical mongrel. Kurt would sometimes help the Melvins haul their equipment to Seattle for gigs. Aberdeen didn't have much of a musical history, although half of platinum-selling speed meddlers, Metal Church, hailed from the town, and a band that played in Seattle was big news. Kurt was very unhappy about getting shuttled from relative to relative. In May of 1984, Wendy had remarried Pat O'Connor, a longshoreman. I'm pretty sure Wendy's still married to Pat O'Connor. Pat was drinking heavily then, and Wendy had her hands full with that. She didn't feel she could also deal with Kurt, but Kurt eventually convinced her to have him back. It took months of being on the phone, crying every night, trying to talk her into letting me live with her, says Kurt. Man, when he became famous, her and Pat sure hauled their asses to Seattle to meet him at his first big Seattle show. It'd have been funny if Kurt would have said, there's not enough room here in the Seattle Coliseum and I don't think I can deal with you right now. Pat went out one night and didn't come back until 7 in the morning, drunk and as Wendy puts it, reeking of a girl. She was furious, but she still went to work at the department store. Then a couple of townies walked through the store just to taunt her. Hey, where was Pat last night? They cackled. Wendy got so mad that she went out and got drunk with a friend, then came home and exploded at Pat. In front of both the kids, she grabbed one of his many guns out of the closet and threatened to shoot him in front of her children. But she couldn't figure out how to load the gun. Then she took all his guns, shotguns, pistols, rifles, even antique guns, and dragged them down the alley with Kim hauling a big bag of bullets to the Wishka River and dumped them in. Kurt was watching from his bedroom window. Later that day, he paid a couple of kids to fish as many guns as they could find out of the river and then sold them. Kurt bought his first amplifier with the proceeds. Then he drove the guy who sold the amp to him to his pot dealer's place and the guy spent all the money on pot. Kurt played his guitar very loud. The neighbors complained. Wendy marked up the ceiling with her broom handle. Kurt loved it when the family left to go shopping or something because that meant he could crank it up. We'd come home hoping we had windows left, says Wendy. Kurt tried to get his friends to play with him, but no one had any musical talent. He'd be very bossy and direct in his criticism. He knew exactly what he wanted. Nobody knew he was also singing up there in his room. One day, says Wendy, Pat and I heard him. He was singing real low. He did not want us to hear it. We put our ears to the door and we both looked at each other, wrinkled up our noses and said, better stick to the guitar. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to conclude chapter one of Come As You Are, The Story of Nirvana by Michael Azared, published in October of 1993. I hope you enjoyed. I will be continuing with this story, but I have several very large projects going on right now. Epstein, River Phoenix, the whole series. I've got a lot on my plate right now. I don't know when I'll read the next chapter but I will finish this whole book. Even if it takes me an entire year, I will eventually have this whole book on my channel. Thank you so much for watching, for listening. This would be a great thing to bicycle to or listen to on your way to work, Or, but uh, really it's just me reading. Hope you enjoyed. Please leave a like. You guys know how much likes count on YouTube. And uh, comment if you'd like to comment if you'd like to talk about the story thus far i'd be interested in listening to what you guys have to say thank you so much i'll see you in the next video which will probably be the follow-up video to epstein bye bye